Hey everybody, welcome to our final episode of Chasing Frets for this week. I'm joined by my co-host Joe Gore. Hi, stoked to be here with Jason and Kirk Fletcher, a remarkable guitarist and person. Yeah, and so we're going to wrap up this week by uh, talking about how Kirk stretches the boundaries of the blues form as a songwriter. And one thing I love about his music and, and his music of some of his contemporaries like Matt Schofield and Josh Smith is that it's there's elements, there's enough of a tradition in, in the songwriting that you recognize that it's influenced by a genre, but yet it's enough variety to keep the listener interested. Yeah, and also as as uh, as as you know, Kirk has mentioned through the course of the week, he lives in Switzerland these days, but he's an LA guy, and um, his entree to blues playing was kind of more through the modern session, you know, Larry Carlton, Robin Ford school. And uh, it sounds a bit like he almost worked backwards into the more rootsy stuff. Yeah, yeah, he kind of fell into it because uh, you know he's, as you heard on Monday, his his prime influence of his of his brothers was kind of modern funk and R and B and and rock guitar that was happening in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, it's like and, yeah, eighties rock first, vintage blues later. So uh, so it's such a treat to to hang with Kirk and and catch up with him. Uh, so hope you enjoy this episode today, and we'll see you guys next week. All right, Kirk. Thanks. Uh, thanks again for hanging with us this week, man. It's so good to, to catch up with you and spend more than a few fleeting moments in the halls of Nam, hanging and talking. You know what? 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 Jason said. It's. It's a. You're a fun guy to talk to, and you dispense a lot of wisdom. And it's been an honor to hang with you. Hopefully, it won't be the last. <laughs> I sure hope so. It's. Uh, this has been an absolute delight. But we're not done yet. We're not done. So today, I want to talk to you about uh, a little bit about some tunes from your new record, and yeah. also kind of how you write new blues tunes. And sure. one of the things that fascinates me with your music and our mutual buddy Josh Smith and Matt Schofield's yeah. music <laughs> is that you guys are really pushing the boundaries of that a a blues song does not have to revolve around. 12 bar form yeah and i kind of stumbled across this by accident because one time i I'd, I'd put on a put on a blues thing on shuffle and with this 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 matt schofield tune came by and i wish i could remember off the top off the top of my head the name of the tune but it's this fast tune in seven yeah. and it just caught my ear like oh man what wow. what an inventive way to kind of use elements of blues music traditional elements of blues music but yet put a kind of a new spin on it. So yeah. on this new record, when you go to write tunes for a record, is that is trying to tweak the form something that's always in the back of your head? Not at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, just like I said it, you know, it's like when I hear like Ennis Island Way or Miles Davis or something like that, you know, I hear like these long things, maybe over one chord or something like that, you know. I kind of just like, or even like funk grooves or anything, I kind of go, man, there's a lot that could be said with just like one chord. So for me, I have a different sort of way of looking at it, probably out of laziness too. But, you know, if if a song, if I feel like a melody or something, because the way I write songs is usually just lyrics of something, a line or a phrase in my head, you know, and I'll like kind of flush it out, you know. That's kind of the way I write songs. And then I'll think of sort of like being sort of a session musician. Like, okay, what can I, you know, add my music to these lyrics? You know, sort of the real folky way of, you know, adding music to lyrics. So that usually I'll just try and find a groove. And if the song calls for needing some more chords or something, you know, I'll like maybe try and, you know, hash it out a little bit, you know, but I don't consciously think about, you know, oh, I want to try and push the envelope and I have to do this or whatever, you know, because a lot of the music that I like is really, really simple. You know, you think about the funk music and you think about blues and all of these different forms, soul music, you know, Memphis soul or whatever, you know, it's like pretty kind of simple forms, you know. So I think the real thing that I try and do is try and come up with like a meaningful 
phrase, you know, something that sticks in my head, kind of like a lyrical no phrase or a musical down. phrase or a, a lyrical, lyrical phrase. phrase, you know, like ain't no cure for the downhearted, you know. That was gonna be my that was gonna be my next <laughs> sentence, man, because you know, we should we should call out your album by name. And it's it's uh, you know, Kirk's new album is called uh, My Blues Blues Pathway. And it's a, it's a lovely record. And that, like you mentioned, the opening track, Ain't, Ain't, no, uh, Ain't No Cure for the Downhearted. That's a that's quite a tour de force. <laughs> There's a lot going on there. It's it's interesting, you know, because not knowing exactly what to expect when I put on the record, I was a little yeah. bit surprised because the first thing you hear is that kind of stereo-y, ping pong, <laughs> rhythm, rhythm guitars, <laughs> which is a... I know. Well, I was. My thought was, where did that come from? But yeah, well, you talked about yeah. what you talked earlier this week. You know that you did come up in the eighties and eighties, eighties. Uh, you know, uh, you know, pop and R and B and MTV were influences. Yeah, and that does That's sound exactly like it could have been yeah. something out of Minneapolis. You know. Yeah, you know that chorus kind of thing because I just felt like people are so far away from that. I'm like, I'm gonna go right to it. I'm always like that. I always try and go, you know, the other way. I always purposely sometimes i'll put limitations on myself i'll bring one guitar pedal to a gig just to be weird play one guitar for a whole record you know just to be different anti what everybody else is doing so i'm like man this will be a good time to not put any fender roads on the record put a little chorus on that intro part you know and just take myself back to some of the records i love from the 80s yeah, yeah. but it's you know you're t- kind of talking about you know, again, I think you're, I think you're um, erring on the side of humble a little bit here. Cause you know, you, I, I believe you when you say you're not self-conscious about what you do, but your nature seems to be, you know, you know, reach out and grab the surprising influencer, you know, take the path not taken. So it's not like, I mean, there's nothing purist about what you do. Um, well, you know, for a lot of years, I thought that, you know, I needed to stick very close to, the art form. And I think that was good practice for myself, you know, but also now I'm at a point where I'm sort of like thinking more like songwriting kind of things, you know, like that. So, you know, that like that song is just like a combination of like thinking like this Robin Ford thing that I lifted off of one of his arrangements of a song and then like Robert Cray, you know, but done sort of my way, just little, Things and, and that could go as crazy as hearing Alan Holsworth play something. I'll never be Alan Holsworth, but maybe some little crazy, like little melody will just be a part in a song or something just to give it this kind of, whoa, what was that? Mm-hmm. You know, in a way that fits with what's going on. So in that regard, I do listen a lot and, you know, bring in these different influences more so you know, parts and things more so than guitar solos, maybe. You, you sure caught me by surprise. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you the type of uh, writer who will bring in an overabundance of songs to a project? No. Or are you just uh-uh. like, <laughs> you're just like, no. oh, I got 10 guys. Let's get, let's get uh, 10. Right, we got 10, barely. <laughs> you know, I had maybe a couple others, but I didn't get around to doing them because I didn't feel... You know, I kind of, I'm a, I'm like sort of a one take guy, not because I think, oh yeah, I'm a one take guy. No, because all the other takes will be terrible because, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what it is. I have this weird thing. I would make the worst session guitar player. I could come up with ideas, but like to repeat the idea again and, you know, being a session guitar player, terrible, you know. That's, I, but, I feel the same way with my band when we're recording an album and I'll play it solo. They're like, oh. Do that again, and I'm like, I I'll try, but I, I'll, you know, if you could play it back for me, I might be able to pick up something what you're talking yeah. about. But but aren't there, the aren't, there, like aren't there aren't there aren't there a million? I mean, but yeah, there's, you know, also you know, there is something magical about the first and second take that you can't get back. Yeah, and aren't there aren't there a zillion records, especially guitar records, where you think, yeah. oh, man, I'd rather I'd rather you. You know, you work this over too much. It's too, it's too <laughs> pure. It's too perfect. I wish I could. I wish I could hear what you what you played when you plugged in and were finishing your first cup of coffee. Yeah, you know, there was probably well, that, something magical to that that got lost. Well, that record, this my blues pathway is definitely that. 
you know, it's definitely, you know, I mean, Travis Carlton, my dear friend, bass player, Travis Carlton, he was like, man, can we do this again? I'm like, no, just fix your part. I cannot do it over again. It's going to lose like this thing that I want, you know, this kind of fresh thing or whatever. And adding to that, speaking of Jimi Hendrix again, wasn't When Cries Mary the end of the tape? Like he just had like maybe 10 minutes to do When Cries Mary and you got When Cries Mary? I hadn't I hadn't heard that, but if so, I mean, damn. Like, so, you know, something to be said for that concept, I think. But, you know, you listen to, you know, in the in the last decade or so, we've all been lucky to have access to um, a lot of classic recordings, you know, that have been busted yeah. out into the individual tracks. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one thing about, you know, hearing hearing the Hendrix tracks, you know, with the guitar isolated, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of, it's, you hear the flubs. You hear that, yeah. he, you hear that he wasn't God. You know, yeah. I mean, at least not in terms of technique, <laughs> but, yeah. but thank God he, you know, but there's so much soul and spirit in those recordings yeah. and I'm, you know, I'm glad he didn't go back and, you know, overwork it 20 times. Yeah. Um, and same, same with a lot of great records, you know, it's like, yeah, we've gotten more, we've gotten, we focused so much more on the perfectionism or whether the kick is exactly aligned with the bass drum on that note. And Plus, like, you know, vocalists now, too, you know, it's like with the making everything super perfect and everything. And when you think about some of those older records and the intensity and just the girth of them, you go, man, we need to do that again. No. <laughs> yeah, no, they, it's, you know, yeah, they would, do, you know, maybe two, three takes, you know, but yeah. the con that concept of, you know, polishing everything, you know, like a gemstone, every track, every yeah. note, every beat, you know. Yeah, definitely something's lost along the way. When you go yeah. into a project like this, Kirk, do you mm -hmm. uh, what's your demo process like to document these song ideas? Oh man, if you could only hear the demos that I done on my voice memo, it was terrible. They're probably but, great, <laughs> but you know, like like I really do have a concept in my brain of what I want, what I want it to sound like, how the bass and the drums are going to go together, how the, the rhythm, because I really do think about when I write songs, I really do think like I have this split brain. I'm thinking about like, I'm a rhythm guitar player and I'm going in here to play a rhythm part on this song. I don't think about it's my song. I just think about what's the perfect rhythm part that I want to hear on this song, you know? So I really do kind of have this split. Maybe that's a bad thing, but I have this, uh, split kind of thing where I really am like the session guitar player going in to work on the session, you know, like I would anybody else or whatever, you know, and that's really a lot of fun for me because I don't get to do that much front in my own band, you know? So I hear the track and I hear the basic stuff and then I just try and find out, you know, what will go with this, what two guitar parts, you know, like kind of a counterpoint or something like that, you know, that'll kind of, go with it. And I've done that even in a blues context, you know, because Chicago blues has a lot of this with, you know, Little Walter, Sonny Boy, James Cotton, they had two guitars and they're playing these intertwined and, you know, just this crazy thing. And it's, you know, so I, I really dig that a lot. And I really like the track uh, with you and Charlie Musselwhite. Oh, I know you've Charlie. played with him quite, I mean, he, he <laughs> seems to be like, What's it like? He has a long list of guitar players, yeah, uh, who have come through his ranks, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so, how did when did you guys first kind of get together and start to play? Well, you know, I was kind of playing with all the harmonica players in LA, you know, during that time, the late '90s, early 2000s, and um, I think he just he was looking for a guitar player after a buddy of mine, John Wiedemeyer, was um, leaving the band. And like he came down to LA and Jennifer Magnus, this wonderful singer from LA, uh, I said, can I come to your gig and sit in so Charlie Musselwhite can <laughs> hear how I sound live? You know, she was like, sure, you know. So that was really it, you know, it was just sort of word of mouth through all the other harmonica players and friends that I have, you know, and we just hit it off. It was a fantastic time because you're playing with a, a legend and you're playing with somebody who's like, Come on, you know, I don't want you to just play traditional stuff. Just bring it. Come on with it. You know, I mean, the guy had Harvey Mandel on his first record. You know, I mean, the guy wants you to play. Yeah. 
you know, so I really started to come into my own even more, you know, and just, okay, I got to play some more and I got to keep it interesting and soulful and within the context, you know, but still explore, you know. And so did you tour, so, tour and record with him or? Yeah, I played with, played in Charlie's band for at least two years. I think, and I went straight from, yeah. Because uh, I, I saw him when I was in high school and John was in the band. And, oh and yeah, I didn't, the week. I didn't know anything <laughs> about him, and he rips off the first solo. And I'd already, I'd already, uh, I was quite familiar with like Robin oh, Ford, and I just yeah. like, turned my head. I was like, "Who is this guy?" You know, that's what I said and, when I saw that band. And I snuck, I, like, I snuck backstage and got to meet him, and he was, yeah, he was, he was playing a blonde three thirty five. I'll never blonde forget 335. it. And man, talk about a guy who's who's unheralded. Like, oh man, John Wiedemeyer is guitar player. ridiculous on the guitar. Yeah. And the nicest guy, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's why Andy Ellis, who's another co host of this podcast, one day yeah. we were talking about, like, when you, were in, when you were in San Francisco, Andy, were there any cats that were just like all the guitar players would go check out? And he brought up John's yeah. name. Oh, he's yeah. Like, he's the guy that would always, people would always go come and check out. Oh, yeah. yeah. He had this band up in the, um, Bay Area and they would play and it was kind of a legendary thing, you know, this trio he would play and he would rip off like be doing like a blues song and then rip off like eruption or something. <laughs> He's like, what planet are you coming from, man? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So check out yeah. John Wiedemeyer for sure. For sure, everybody. Yeah. Uh you, you said something interesting a few minutes ago when you were talking about the when you when you're writing and when you're trans yeah. when you're bringing your songs into uh, reality in the studio. And you mm -hmm. talked about putting on different heads a little bit. Like, you know, yeah. you, you know, there's the song, you come in as the songwriter, but then you, you know, step aside and regard it from the point of view of the session player. I think, you know, if I weren't yeah. the singer songwriter, what would I be trying to add to this? Yeah. And that brought up something that hits me really hard about your playing is that, um, this comparison could potentially be really insulting and I don't mean it that way, Never. but it's a little bit like, <laughs> no, it's like, it's like, it's a little bit like 20 personalities residing inside the same consciousness. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I'm basically saying you're psycho. No, no, but, Absolutely. No, but when you play. I am psycho. Really? <laughs> when, I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. But you, but you, you know, you hear that when you play, it feels like every four bars, every eight bars, like a new, you know, you, you, take off this mask and there's this whole other personality and it's, it's, it's thrilling. You know, you hear, um, it almost feels like I'm hearing different characters or, you know, when I hear that, when I hear the 10 minute solo, it feels like I've been hearing, you know, eight guitar players going around in a circle trading solos, you know, you. you yeah. Well, you, that, that's how my mind kind of, I kind of play these little uh, games with myself. You know, I kind of like, if I ever get stuck, then, you know, in my arsenal, I can, kind of break oh so how would this person maybe inspired by albert king bb king or, or maybe even obs more obscure uh people you know or whatever you know but in the studio like a lot of times you know like on my last record there's this song called uh i think it's dupree for cornell dupree and you know on that solo the rhythm guitar I'm like trying to emulate in some ways Wah Wah Watson and uh, Freddie Stone, you know, and Sugar Otis, all in that little, you know, just deceptive little thing in there. But that's really how I approach a lot of things. You know, I'll be like, oh man, what if Wah Wah Watson was on this song? Or what if Freddie Stone or Prince or what if, you know, you had this like, Billy Gibbons thing going on, you know, just the attitude and stuff. And that's really always been fun for me, you know. No, you, you really. hear it and it makes it's makes this it makes the solos riveting. You know, you just you okay. don't know what's coming next. And it's a you know, it's a surprise at every turn. Um thank you. you know, don't get don't get sane on us, okay? <laughs> it really is like that though. It's it's really kind of nuts sometimes, you know, about and then I try and come up with a lot of parts and stuff too. So I, I'm pretty good with coming up with parts and stuff, but remembering the parts, that's, you know, the worst for me. That's why we record them, right? <laughs> I try to. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kirk, it's been such a fun week hanging out with you, man. Uh, Thank what, you so much. what do you have uh, coming up? Uh, 
the rest of this year? What do you got? You got the new album that just well, came out. What else? Yeah, my record, My Blues Pathway is out now. And also I'm here in Switzerland and there are a couple gigs on the books, actually. There's a gig. There's one in a few in France and then one in Denmark. So we're all crossing our fingers, yeah. <laughs> you know, that everything goes good and um, just trying to play a little bit with uh, Richard Cousins. Oh, yeah. Fantastic bass player, you know. Nice. And uh, yeah, just hanging out with him a little bit. And Is he over there playing too? records, you know. Hmm? Is he over there? Yeah, he's in Switzerland. Oh, yeah. nice. nice. Crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Kirk. And uh, and we'll uh, we'll talk soon, man. Thank you. It's been a it's been a oh, pleasure, pleasure. on inspiring week with you. Uh, good luck with everything. Oh, thank you so much.